So a lot of you will know me already. I'm the one who organises a lot of events to enhance the scholarship and fellowship experience of our Commonwealth scholars and fellows. So thank you all for coming here today. Um, the aim of this, this is the first in the two of the CSE lecture series that we have. So lecture series aim to connect Commonwealth scholars and fellows with academics, with experts in different areas of development to help you make the development impact on your return home to your own countries. So today we're joined by a few members of staff from the University of Manchester. We're also joined by Christelle Lee, who's one of the program officers at the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission, and Annabelle Bold, who's coming in later, who's the senior program officer at the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission. So if you're interested in ways you can get connected, um, to kind of share information about this today's Let's Just See This event. You can use, um, if you're on Twitter, you can um, include us our Twitter handle, which is at comscores, which is on the screen behind me, and use the, the Twitter hashtag, which is CSC Lecture, so just to promote it and you know, share information about it. So today's lecture is about information and communication technologies for development. We all know how important ICTs are continuing to be. Um, the role they have in healthcare, in education, in, in so many different areas that relate to development. So this lecture is aiming to give you an insight into that, give you ideas and different things that you can do relating to ICTs that can help to support your development impact. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker today, who is Professor Richard Heeks. So he is the Professor of Development Informatics in the Global Development Institute, which is part of the School of Environment, Education and Development at the University of Manchester. And he's also Director of the Centre for Development Informatics and Moderator of the ICTs um, for Development Blog. So he works in the growing field of Development Informatics, which researches ICT4D, which is Information and Communication Technologies for Development. So this analyzes the relationship between informatics which are things such as the internet, computing, mobiles, and digital data, and key social, social economic development processes, um, for example, poverty alleviation, economic growth, and environmental sustainability. So he's going to explore some of those things in his talk, so I'll hand over to Professor Geeks. Thank you. Thanks very much to the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission for the invitation to speak with you today. Thanks also to Emma and Joe and their colleagues at the university for hosting the event uh, here. As Corelli said, I'm, I'm Richard Heath, I'm director of the university's Centre for Development Informatics, which uh, we like to claim certainly that we are the largest group worldwide studying ICTs, information and communication technologies, and socioeconomic development. We consist of 10 academic staff members, around two dozen doctoral researchers, and around about 100 master's students, um, some of whom, again, thanks to the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission, are uh, going to be sponsored by CSC as of next year. I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes or so, talk a little bit about me and, and the centre in, in Manchester, talk a bit about some of the sort of the changing nature of the relationship between ICTs and development, look at some key challenges and then look at some key actions that we might take in order to address those challenges. So first of all, our work at the Centre for Development Informatics falling into four main areas. So first of all, digital economy, so that might be looking at things to do with better policies for ICT startups, how do we improve the functioning of e-business in developing countries. Um, we've got a project as well, just starting up, that's going to be about precision agriculture. So that was going to be looking at the role of data from sensors and drones and how that can improve agricultural decision making and agricultural productivity, specifically in, in this case in, in Ghana. Digital transformation looks at the role of a set of emerging technologies and the way in which they are interacting with development. Things like 
new forms of data, things like 3D printing. The example here is taken from a project we're doing about big data in electricity distribution in India. Third area we look at is digital inclusion, which researches the role of um, ICTs in reducing socio-economic inequalities. So the example here is a project we're doing that looks at what's called IT impact sourcing, which is the outsourcing of IT work to marginalised groups, in, in this particular case to members of low-income families in Malaysia. Last area we look at is digital sustainability, so the relationship between digital technologies and sustainable development. The project that's shown there was an initiative trying to work out how best do we use ICTs to improve the resilience of coffee farming communities in Uganda. So, those are the areas that we work on in the centre. Um, and the reason we work on them is because we believe that all of those are important to the future relationship between ICTs and development. That's what we're doing now, but um, I have uh, a, a long career in, in ICTs and development that goes back a long way before those. I'm sorry to tell you that this next picture I wish it was, but it's not me. Um, but I probably looked a bit like that back in those days. The reason it's there is actually not because of the nice young gentleman. Um, but because of the, uh, the computer, which is, which is kind of where I, I began my uh, ICTs and development career. I actually began my ICT career um, as a program on punch card systems. That is how old I am. Working for the flagship of the British computer industry, which was called ICL, which probably none of you have heard of, because it is a flagship that sank many, many years ago. <laughs> but in 1981, I went out to Nepal to undertake a research project on leprosy. And as part of that, my first engagement with ICTs in developing countries was trying and failing to set up a patient record database on that very type of computer, which is a Tandy TRS microcomputer, the very latest thing. You can imagine how much, how much RAM it, uh, it had in those days. Barring the odd interlude, so for example, uh, being a teacher for a couple of years in a, in a rural secondary school in, in Nigeria, barring a couple of interludes, I've worked ever since on ICTs and developing countries, and that puts me in a good position to have a quite a broad historical overview of the field. And let me share one of those broad historical overviews with you, which is an idea that there are three paradigms of the relationship, or you might say three phases of the relationship between ICTs and development. So first of all, what I've called a pre-digital paradigm, which lasted from around the mid-1940s to about the mid-1990s. I call it pre-digital. Of course, the ICTs that were involved were digital, but it's kind of pre-digital because there wasn't any real relationship between ICTs and international development at the time. At first, international development, development actors just kind of completely ignored ICTs during around the, the 1940s, 50s, 60s, even really into the 70s. And then in the latter half of the period, yes, ICTs were diffusing a little bit into developing countries, but they were still isolated from the development mainstream. So computers were being used for internal admin purposes in large, private, and public sector organisations, or ICTs were creating a very few elite IT sector jobs in a few <coughs> countries. But the broad mass of the populace in the Global South had no relationship with ICTs whatsoever. The ICT for D paradigm emerged probably from about the mid-1990s onwards. It's dominant now, and it's going to dominate for the next 10 to 20 years um, or so. It sees digital ICTs as a useful tool for development. It really kick-started around the turn of the century because first of all we had the advent of the internet, at least in the global north, which was a tool in search of purposes. And at the same time we had the Millennium Development Goals, which were purposes in search of tools. And these two things came together and people said, aha, now we're going we're to have really a role for ICTs in delivering 
development goals. Indeed, initially around the turn of the century, ICTs were idolised people who were saying, oh, they're going to be the tool to deliver development. After a few years, we, we kind of calmed down a bit, and the ICT fitting paradigm said, well, no, okay. ICTs are going to be a tool to help to deliver development. So that is what is dominant at the moment. But we can start to see some glimmers, very slowly, of a third phase, a third paradigm in the relationship between ICTs and development, which we can call digital development. And that conceptualizes ICTs not as a tool that might help to deliver particular development goals, but as the platform that is eventually going to mediate pretty well all of development. Of course, as per the graph there, this isn't going to happen for many, many decades, but we can start to see the glimmers of what is coming down the track. So, that new paradigm is particularly based around a set of new technologies that are coming up. Not just the technologies of the current ICT for D era, which was the telecenter and then the internet and connected PC and the mobile phone and the smartphone. Those, of course, are going to be the dominant technologies linking ICTs and development for quite some time. But digital development is going to be based on a set of new and emerging technologies. Some of the ones that I described that we're, that we're undertaking this year. So, for example, new forms of data. Big data, open data, real-time data, mobile data. Um, new production technologies, 3D printing, robotics, all of the other components of what we're calling Industry 4.0. New field technologies as well, so the drones and the sensors and other elements that are making up the, in the, in the Internet of Things. And binding much of this together, the digital platforms that are going to play an ever bigger role in economic and social development. Google and Facebook and Uber and Upwork and, and so forth. We're, the past couple of years, I say, we're, we're now at a kind of pivot point more generally of starting to really think about digital platforms, hence why I said that digital development was about ICTs <coughs> as a platform for development. So that's one view of the kind of paradigmatic <coughs> shifts that are underway in the relationship to <coughs> ICTs and development. Another shift that we can see is that over time, a set of different issues have arisen, a set of different concerns in this relationship between technology and development. So back in the 1960s and the 1970s, the main issue was seen to be how do we transfer computing technologies from industrialised countries to developing countries. That transfer process didn't quite work out as it was hoped. It was thought you could just uproot technologies and pop them into the global south and all of the world. It didn't really work out like that. And so in the 1980s, there came to be a growing interest in seeing the technology not simply as technology as standalone, but as part of an information system that consisted of people and consisted of organisations, all set within a wider context. And out of that, we came to recognize the challenge of what we've come to call design reality gaps. That is, a mismatch between the design of ICT for these systems and the development reality into which those systems are implemented. And that mismatch between design and reality leading to a great deal of failure of ICT for D initiatives. Well, over time, as particularly the internet began diffusing widely in the global north, the focus of concerns changed again. It didn't quite change, as you can see. We started to kind of supplement new concerns that added on. So the focus shifted to ways in which access to the internet could be achieved in the global south. A lot of thinking about infrastructure. As I mentioned, telecenters were the model. Now we're thinking much more about mobiles and, and smartphones as the way of providing access. And also, during that first decade of the 21st century, real diffusion of ICTs in developing countries was still pretty limited. And so as a result, our focus was often talking about the potential of ICTs to deliver development a little more than it was really about the actuality. And then the current phase that, that is dominating at the moment, from around the turn of the, of the decade, from 2010 onwards, has been a growing interest in how we design 
digital systems in and for developing countries. Kind of terms and, and um, ideas we've come up with, inclusive innovation, participative design, that sort of thing. And we've moved from this notion of potential a little bit more because from around 2010 onwards, the longevity of interaction with ICTs in development, the scope of diffusion of ICTs in development was such that we could really start to understand what impact are ICTs having on development. And in the remainder of my talk, I'm going to, I'm going to particularly look at that, this notion of the emerging impacts that we are aware of. Um, if you want to know more, the, the, the flyer I've sent around about the book that's coming out in the autumn, the detail, if you like, of the answer about What's the relationship, the benefits, and also challenges of ICTs and development are, are in the book. I'm only going to focus on a very small subset of, of issues in, in what I say today. And particularly, I'm, I'm going to talk less about the benefits and more about emerging, challenging patterns that we can start to see emerging that will grow during ICT for D as a paradigm and are likely to grow even more as a digital development paradigm for you. So, the first pattern of impact that we see emerging is that of digital exclusion. A lot of that will be familiar with, to you, the idea of a digital divide here. On one side we've got the haves and on the other side we've got the have-nots. We often think of that or talk about that in terms of those who have and have not got access to ICTs. But it's a little bit broader than that as well because one could, one could still have access to ICTs but not have access to the benefits of it. ICTs. And that's clearly going to be problematic because if we look across the sustainable development goals, we can see that ICTs are going to be important in the delivery of sustainable development goals. We can already see some signs, but they're small signs, of what benefits ICTs can bring. So they can bring incremental income increases to those who are living in poverty. They can generate some small improvements in agricultural productivity. They can lead to some uptick in the quality of healthcare. And so on, you could go throughout all of the SDGs and see the general picture we have so far is incremental, not transformational benefits today from ICTs. We can also see that the nature of the digital exclusion is going to be changing as we move into a digital development era. So for example, we talk about this notion of data intensive development, the ever greater use and presence and salience of data within international development. As that's occurring, as more and more government and donor and NGO and private sector and other decision makers are making use of ever more data, ever more digital data in their decision making, that's going to be problematic for those citizens who are not represented in the data sets. Because if they're not in the data sets, people can't make decisions about them, and the more we use digital data, the more we imagine that that reflects the truth of the world. So as an example, a project we're doing in India around land records finds that urban planners in India are increasingly using online land records for urban planning decisions. But what does that mean for the slum dwellers who are not present, not represented in those databases? So that's another form of digital divide that is emerging as we move forward in the relationship between ICTs and development. A second impact pattern kind of related is digital inequality. Um, of course, exclusion, the digital divide, cause inequality between the haves and the have-nots. But there are other sources that help to explain growing inequality within the global south. And to understand that, we have to see that the emerging world is not simply a divide between haves and have-nots, but it's more of a continuum. At one end we have the privileged haves, at the other end, and there's only a few of them, at the other end we have a few have-nots. Only a few, I say, are true have-nots that are really excluded from digital networks, because very few people these days don't have direct access to digital technologies of any sort, and even fewer people don't have indirect access, i.e. a friend or someone else who can send an email for them or make a phone call and so on. So in terms of true have-nots, truly excluded, relatively rare, the biggest bulk of people are those 
the people who are have lesses, people who um, are being created by two related phenomena, asymmetrical benefits and adverse incorporation. What do we mean by those? Asymmetrical benefits means that when ICTs are introduced into a situation, the spread of benefits is uneven. Those who have more power, more skills, more money, and so on, benefit more, and the gap increases between those who have more of those resources and power and control versus those who do not. Adverse incorporation means people are increasingly being drawn into economic and social systems in which they are systematically disadvantaged. So, let me give a couple of examples that are illustrated here again from our research. So, here's our research that we're doing on big data in electricity distribution in India. Big data because millions of smart meters, oh, sorry, online meters are being uh, introduced, have been introduced at the customer end, and millions of meters and sensors and so on are being attached to transformers and lines and, and, and so on. The first shift we see is a shift in power from the public to the private sector. Why? Because it is private sector providers who are designing and building and operating the big data systems being used by the public sector electricity corporations. And so public sector organizations now have lost control of their own data which, of course, in the past, they used to own. Increasing an inequality between public and private sector. We're also seeing an increase, a shift in power, an increase in inequality between workers and managers. So, for instance, meter readers are no longer important if you've got online meters. So, thousands of them are being sacked, and the few of them who remain are subject to data-related oversight by managers, managerial digital surveillance. They can see and understand exactly what the readers, the meter readers are doing um, at all times. Again, exacerbating existing inequalities. Sense of adverse incorporation, we can illustrate from work we're doing on the digital, on digital gig economy workers, or digital labor, goes by various different names, crowd workers, online outsourcing, and so on, in Pakistan and uh, Malaysia. Specifically, these are people who go on platforms you might have heard of, like Upwork and Freelancer and Fiverr, and they go online and they find jobs, data entry, digitization, transcription, image labeling. <coughs> what we find is a very few people thrive in those environments. The vast majority do not. Because of the hyper-competitive nature of these platforms, which are completely out with regulatory oversight of government, and of course there are no digital labor unions and so on because of the hyper-competitive nature. The price that is paid for jobs is a kind of race to the bottom. And we also find digital gig economy workers spending a lot of their time unpaid, training themselves, looking for jobs, bidding for jobs, which they're often unsuccessful for. And we also find that they are sometimes cheated of the payments by the client without real recourse to get their money back. So again, exacerbating the inequalities that already exist between workers and business as a result of being adversely incorporated into this digital economic system. Final challenging impact pattern I'm not going to say very much about, but that is the various digital harms, or we might say other digital harms that we are seeing emerge. Cybercrime, we've seen the recent round of Ransomware uh, attacks, which have particularly hit a number of developing country institutions. Cyber harms, online pornography, online gambling, uh, violation of rights, online bullying, loss of uh, privacy online, and the kind of cyber monopolies that are growing up and which exacerbate the digital inequalities that I talked about previously. In sum, then, we face a set of growing challenges in seeking to apply ICTs to develop digital exclusion, digital inequality, digital harms. And if we don't address those challenges, those are going to prevent ICTs contributing towards the achievement of development and the achievement of the sustainable development goals. So, what do we need to do in order to address these challenges? There's a very long list, but I'm going to talk about four things, which is innovation, intervention, 
participation and appropriation. First of all, we're going to need new technologies to be innovated to ensure access and affordability and usability by those at the base of the economic pyramid. What we call these days inclusive innovation. Uh, as an example in terms of access, we're going to need things like microsatellites and drones and balloons. This is, balloons, this is um, Google's Project Loon that are going to fill in the blanks on the map to provide internet access for those who do not have we're going to need to take action on affordability. Here's another example. This is South African company Onyx Connect, which is promising a $30 smartphone for the African market. However, technology alone is not going to be enough. We're going to need to put in a number of other complementary inputs. All the things that are required to move along the value chain from technology to decisions to actions to development results. So one complementary input is going to have to be capabilities. Of course, capabilities means more and better hands-on skills, but it means more than just hands-on skills. It means the capabilities in developing countries to make effective use of the technologies in organizational and community settings in developing countries. Our belief in that is, is something that guides our master's programmes, both our distance learning and our on-campus master's programmes in, in, in Manchester. Here's our students on their, uh, from the master's programme on their annual fieldwork in uh, South Africa. And we try to introduce them there to the kinds of people that we are trying to build them to be, which is hybrids. People who understand both the role of management in an organizational setting, but also understand the implementation and the impact of digital information systems. Well, some of the students over there who are on our masters in ICT, <coughs> they're tribals because they have those two elements and also understanding the role and function of development and development projects. But capabilities alone are not going to be enough because if just left to themselves, people, we can already see, use new technologies to create new economic and social spaces which are often just like the Wild West. Unregulated spaces in which the poor are increasingly marginalised. So we're going to have to see a regulation or a re-regulation of cyberspace. As these new spaces are created, government is going to have to take action Action to reduce, resist those digital harms. Action to reduce and reduce, resist the digital inequalities that we mentioned. And finally, we can think about the design and the use of uh, digital technologies. I was, I was looking for material on drones and development. I was looking for some pictures on drones and development in Africa. These were pretty much the, some of the first images that came up when I was looking for pictures of drones and development uh, in Africa. I, I wonder if you notice anything peculiar and common of all of those images about drones and development in Africa. Anybody notice anything slightly unusual or funny? Speak up, sir. Uh, the white guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> The drones in all these cases are being operated by a white man. And, and you will probably struggle to find a picture of a drone not being operated by, or in Africa, not being operated by um, a white man. And I'm sure those images re reflect a dominant reality, a reality of a kind of top-down model of development, of course quite literally top-down in the case of uh, cases of, uh, of drones, of technology being designed and often owned and often operated by somebody outside the context of its implementation, by somebody from a global elite embodying that earlier notion that I gave of the asymmetrical benefits of ICTs. So, what do we do in order to get away from that top-down and that unequal approach? What we need to do is to move to a participative model of ICT for D and in later years a participative model of 
digital development. A first step is going to be collaboration, uh, this sort of thing. Getting those who are going to be using the technology at the base of the pyramid, getting those who are intended to be beneficiaries of the technology at the base of the pyramid to be involved as partners in processes of design and implementation. But beyond that, we need to move towards appropriation, which really means kind of taking ownership and control of these new digital technologies. This notion of appropriation is behind the idea, for example, of grassroots innovation. That means harvesting and scaling all of the new uses of ICTs that are happening right now in villages and slum areas and towns and cities in Africa, in Asia, in the Caribbean. But we don't really know about that because the dominant model is Project Bloom. The great lords from Seattle, wherever, coming and giving their solutions to development problems. But as ICTs are diffusing on the ground now, so many of these grassroots innovations are happening, but they're just happening and they're probably trapped in, in, a, in a locale, and we're not releasing all of those new innovative ideas. Appropriation is behind the notion of platform cooperatism, moving to new forms of platforms, not a la Google and Facebook and so on, but platforms which are owned by those in the global south for the benefit of those in the global south. Appropriations behind the idea of small data, which is the mirror image of big data, which says, yeah, we're going to capture new forms, new sources of data, but what we're going to do with them is that we're not going to push them upwards, we're going to push them downwards for ownership and use by the individual communities and households at the base of the pyramid. So, to summarise, we um, are moving forward with an ICT for D paradigm, which is going to dominate for the next 10 to 20 years. We are moving slowly towards and into a digital development paradigm that is going to change the relationship between ICTs and development, moving from this notion of a tool to a platform, moving from a notion of individualised, particularised contributions to development to something that mediates a very large number, majority perhaps even of development processes and structures. This has got the potential to bring significant benefits. It is going to be an essential part of delivering all of the sustainable development goals. But at the same time as those potential benefits, we have these three emerging challenges of digital exclusion, of digital inequality, of digital harm. So, you all have the opportunity to address this in your future work, but only if, as you go back and engage with development, you also engage with one or more of these ideas of digital innovation, of digital intervention, of digital participation, of digital appropriation, so that we help to tip the balance of our digital futures away from the bad and towards the good. If you'd like to know more about this, then please do take a look at our online development informatics working paper series, uh, particularly this one here, which is specifically about digital development, if that's the aspect that we want to know more about. Of course, there are many other elements here around inclusive innovation and big data and many of the other aspects that I talk to. Uh, or, of course, if you want to hold on for the autumn, then uh, this Rampage book will tell you uh, a lot more in a great deal more detail of some of the issues that I've covered this afternoon. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Heeks. I think that gave us a lot of food for thought. So before we go on, we'll have our, our next speaker, which will be Dr. Julian Bess. So questions will be after we have the, the final talk from Dr. Julian Bass. Um, so do kind of think about any questions that you may have just that have come to mind for, for Richard Heeks, um, Professor Heeks, um, after his talk. Um, so yeah, moving on, it's now Dr. Julian Bass, who is a lecturer in software engineering in the School of Computing Science and Engineering at the University of Salford, and is a researcher and participant practitioner in ICT for D. So in May, he co-chaired the 14th International Conference on the Social Implications of Computers in Developing Countries 
and is a senior editor of the Electronic Journal for Information Systems in four different countries. So he has created an analytical framework used to evaluate cloud computing adoption in Nigeria and Ghana and a human resource management system used by the Malaysian government. So, you know, Great. Thank you very much. Let's see. Okay, well, um, as Richard started off uh, thanking all the people who've organised it and invited me along, thank you very much indeed. Um, so, uh, you may be surprised to learn that there are more than one university in Manchester, and I'm from a different one. Uh, I'm from the University of Salford. Uh, was that a hiss? Thank you so much. Um, I'm from one across the town. Uh, so, it's sort of part of Manchester, but it's actually a different city, a different local government area. Uh, it's the University of Salford. Uh, and uh, unlike Richard, uh, my day job is not to try and critically analyse uh, the whole kind of underlying philosophy and social economics of uh, ICT for D. Uh, frankly, I'm an engineer. Uh, I build things, uh, sometimes not very well, uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, I work in a computer science department. And, you know, they're not interested, frankly, in uh, uh, discussions about the relative merits uh, of sort of development issues and so on, they just want to build things. Uh, so I'm coming from a slightly different perspective. Um, although I have to say, you know, uh, as an engineer, we share many of the concerns that Richard touched upon. Uh, we spend a lot of time as engineers worrying about digital harm. So we have specialists uh, who are looking at security issues, who are looking at malware issues, uh, and uh, a whole variety of others. And I'm just sort of mentioning that to try to make some connections uh, to some of the issues that uh, uh, Richard raised. Um, another sort of puzzling difference was I was delighted to see uh, Richard put technology transfer sort of back in the 1980s uh, because I do technology transfer right now. Uh, I have projects with companies that give us money uh, to try and take advantage of expertise within the university uh, in order to assist their business here in the UK. And next week, uh, I'll be at a power station in the UK with one of my partner companies uh, rolling out some software that's going to be used in a power station here in the UK. Um, so we do technology transfer, um, but the fact that we offer people things and, and have expertise does not, people, does not mean people want to take advantage of that. And so the issue of kind of context that Richard was talking about, just having a, a gadget or a widget, uh, does not mean uh, that it's going to automatically find favour. So anyway, um, I, I've got a bit of a, a bone to pick about how projects are managed. Yes, that's very good. Uh, I don't know how to use it, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm interested in um, uh, the ways that people manage uh, projects. and, and um, I mean, another difference between Richard and I, whereas he kind of said, oh, years ago, I used to be a programmer, and then I kind of grew up and started doing other things. I kind of still am a programmer. Uh, <laughs> and so I work in industry, uh, you know, working on software projects. And some of them have been quite large and quite interesting software projects, I like to think. Um, so working, you know, across international boundaries, uh, teams uh, working across different continents, trying to build uh, quite large and complex uh, software systems. Um, and so the, the, that's why I'm kind of interested in the way that these projects are undertaken. So what I want to talk to you about is uh, agile methods, which are becoming a pretty standard way of organizing things, uh, but which I found are not widely understood and used in Africa, uh, for example, uh, and, and at some other parts of the world. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Agile methods and something called lean, uh, lean methods, which is sort of goes back 20 or 30 years in the kind of mechanical manufacturing production engineering kind of space, but which again, as software engineers, we're kind of relearning some of the ideas that car manufacturers were worrying about 20 or 30 years ago. Um, in the introduction, you were kind of enough to mention that we've got an analytical framework. So I'm interested in understanding when projects work and when projects don't work and what are the kind of factors that are influencing that. So uh, I want to kind of give you a, a few moments kind of uh, uh, to think about the framework that we're using. 
And because it helps us to understand the evolution of things over time, and you know, it's kind of hard for us to understand why sometimes initiatives seem to go quite well, but perhaps more often or commonly, initiatives don't go terribly well. So uh, that's uh, why we wanted to try and use this framework to try and understand uh, the factors that are going on. And as has been mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk about two kind of case studies, if you like. A human resource management information system uh, used by the Malaysian government, which is quite a large uh, IT system. Uh, we had a PhD student who successfully uh, completed a PhD looking at that, and so I want to tell you a few uh, little things about that. And uh, I'm interested in cloud computing. Uh, quite a lot of the work I do with companies here in the UK is to do with what we call cloud computing. It's how uh, software is accessible over the internet. Uh, and how we can access computing resources using networks. Uh, and so I'm interested in how that's being adopted in, in Africa. And we found some quite striking differences, for example, on, between Nigeria and Ghana on the one hand, and Ethiopia uh, on the other hand. Uh, and then I'll give you some conclusions. So uh, that's the game plan. So look, here's the conventional wisdom about how you organize a project. And this is a bit skewed towards a software project. But if you've ever tried to build a house, or a school, or a hospital, this will seem very reminiscent. So, you know, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to define the requirements of what it is that you want to build. So you have to work out what the needs are, who all the kind of users are going to be, what all the stakeholders are, and what their needs and interests are, and kind of write everything down and end up with a book. And so, for example, I worked on a, uh, a contract uh, with a project with a bank in, in Canada, in Toronto, as it happens. Uh, where a guy spent months and months and months writing a 30-page book about one requirement. This was a 30-page book about one requirement for a banking system in Toronto. Uh, actually, uh, we didn't use that book. <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of symptomatic of the idea that you have to write down everything really, really carefully, uh, even if what you end up with is sort of nonsense. But anyway, uh, and, then, and then you can do kind of design and uh, um, system design and software design, so you can imagine, you know, if you're talking about buildings, you're creating blueprints and plans, and maybe you're doing sort of 3D fly-throughs and virtual reality simulations of your building or whatever. But anyway, the idea is that you're doing some kind of structural design, how the parts are organized, how the pieces go together. And then once you've finished your design, note that you sort of design the whole thing, and then when you've finished, uh, you're going to start building the system. My badge is falling off, sorry for that. Um, so you're going to start building uh, the thing. You know, the kind of idea here is you can't design something if you don't know what the requirements are, and you can't start building until you've done the design. There's a kind of sequence built into this process. And then we might say we're going to uh, take all the pieces and put them together, and we're going to kind of integrate all of the moving parts, and then we can start testing it all together, and then we can sort of deploy it. And the idea is at that point we have a fantastic handover and everybody's pleased and delighted. I'm sorry to tell you that in the software industry, we've been very poorly served by this understanding of how we should build large and complex systems. Um, and so actually this kind of model is progressively falling out of favor, and we can have some fantastic arguments about right now whether this is now become the minority view uh, of how you build systems. And there are some areas, um, you know, nuclear power stations spring to mind, where this model is going to kind of stay for a while yet. Um, but there are some other areas, business information systems for example, where this model is pretty well dead. Um, and so what people have started to say is, well, you know, what's wrong with planning? Why is this not working? And the kind of fundamental problem is that uh, the world is moving on. While you're going through all these carefully organized steps, you're spending ages gathering all the requirements and writing everything down, the world is kind of changing around you. And, you know, once you've written everything down and the world changes, now you're out of step with reality. The design reality gap that Richard talked about is kind of happening before your very eyes. The projects I'm talking about, uh, you know, often $30 million, they're taking six, nine months to complete, there's 50 plus developers, and yeah, that's not a particularly large project. Um, but that's the kind of problem that you're having, that as everybody's kind of trying to get themselves organized, things are changing. The other problem you've got with this phenomenon is that the further you get into this process, the kind of risks 
that that difference between reality and what you're doing is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so the risks to the project are getting bigger. The amount you've spent is day by day getting bigger. And until you do that final handover, the, the, the sums of money involved are, are, are quite large. If you know, if you've got a thirty million dollar project, you're sort of twenty five million dollars in, and you're still not sure if you're going to have a good result. And the other thing that's key, which you know is intuitive to to many people's ordinary lives, is you want to kind of get feedback on what you're doing. You know, as a student, you don't want to wait until the end of the degree for somebody to say, ah, ah. you know, you want, to, you want to kind of find out along the way, how am I doing? You know, is it going well? Do I, you know, do, are there things I need to change, do differently or whatever? So we want to find ways of developing systems, complex systems, in, initiatives, where we can get feedback along the way. And, and, and on the right-hand side is, is an extract from a thing called the Agile Manifesto, uh, which is kind of making this argument that what we need is to, to rethink the way that we think about uh, building complex systems or initiatives, uh, and we want to kind of emphasize the things on the left, the ability to respond to change, rather than having a carefully organized plan where, you know, I've seen project plans where somebody knows what somebody's going to be doing in, in two years' time on a Tuesday. You know, it's like, hey, <laughs> you know. Uh, I bet that's not going to happen, you know. So why spend the time writing that kind of nonsense down? So what we do is we still need, you know, we still value all these operations. You've still got to design things. You've still got to test things. So it's not that you can't do any of that stuff. But instead of trying to build the whole thing in one kind of massive operation, what you're trying to do is build the system in a series of sort of fragments. Uh, but it, you know, you can say, well, we always used to do that. In the 1970s, we used to build systems in fragments. We kind of divide it up into pieces and design a piece, and then we move on to another piece and design that piece. That's not quite what I mean here. What we're suggesting here is that an increment is fulfilling some kind of subset of needs for somebody. So it's a kind of functioning, working sort of fragment rather than some isolated bit of something that requires other parts to do anything meaningful. So I'll sort of expand on that idea. So let's think of travel bookings. Uh, the particular example I'm thinking of is in the UK, uh, we have a, a very large kind of railway booking system. Uh, and I have, was lucky enough to, to do a research project with some of the people who built that in India, as it happened. Uh, and uh, so here we're talking about travel bookings, it could be railways. It could be buses, it could be flights. Um, and you know, the way that we might have thought about doing it is breaking it up into the fragments, and I don't want to get into the kind of technical details, but you know, you might build the bit that the user sees on the screen on the website. Uh, that could be one piece. You might have another group of people working about thinking about how the data is being stored, and so they design a database, uh, and you know, there might be other people who are thinking about the sort of logic of the bookings. The problem with that model, which I've seen sort of firsthand on some of these large projects, is that when you come to put the pieces together, they don't work, and by the time you've built all those pieces, the, the, the kind of world has moved on and has invalidated some of the assumptions that you made at the beginning. So instead of building a, a system like that, what we advocate these days is, is trying to kind of strip all of the superfluous detail out of the problem. And what they did on this particular railway booking system was they just made a simple booking of direct journeys from one place to another without any worry about sort of seat allocations or power or sitting next to the window or whether you had luggage or you didn't have luggage or how much luggage you had. So you can sort of boil it down to a very simple thing. And I mean, in the very first increments of this system, you didn't even have to pay. I mean, obviously, they're not going to give this to the public. But you can build a booking system that doesn't actually require any step pay payment stage or anything like that. So you can kind of simplify things. But what you've got then is something you can take to users, stakeholders, customers, whoever it might be, and say, look, this is the bare bones of your booking system. Is that what you want? And they can say, yeah, brilliant, on you go. Now we can worry about do you want to face the front or the back, or do you want to be on an aisle or next to a window? You know, and, and that other detail can then be added in subsequent phases. It does require that you have to have a bit that the user can see. It does require something to store the information. It does require some logic to do. But instead of building a whole bunch of those components, 
you're just focused on fulfilling a particular need. Uh, and so the, 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 that kind of outlines the, uh, the, 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 the technique. And if you haven't seen it before, that uh, C stack is up in Scotland. Uh, it's um, uh, quite high, actually, 137 metres high. And uh, there's pictures, paintings of it uh, 150 years ago where it was sort of twice as wide, so half of it's fallen down uh, since then. But it's quite a remote spot and very spectacular if you can get a chance uh, to visit. So the idea of these uh, increments is that you can uh, do all your sort of, uh, do some requirements, do some design, build something, test it, give it to a customer and get some feedback, and then you can move on to uh, implement other sort of fragments of the, uh, the, the, the system. And the idea is there's a curve here, which is instead of the risk kind of getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as the project goes on, what's actually happening is the risk is getting less and less and less because the things you're building are more and more trivial in compared with what you've already built. So there's a kind of progressive sense of warmth and positivity and so on that you get on these kinds of projects when they're going well. So if we look at um, those increments, uh, what software engineers like to do nowadays uh, is think of an increment uh, and then want to start comparing a particular increment with other things that have gone before. So they're trying to get into a rhythm of producing stuff again and again and again over time. And what we're interested then is thinking of how can I make each one of these increments more efficient, more productive, better quality product, more product. Uh, how can I enhance uh, that uh, uh, activity? So we come to these lean principles. There's a whole bunch of them. I won't go through them all in, in, in a great deal of detail, but the idea is that you, you're sort of thinking of a, of a slice of something you're building. I'm talking about software, but it could be other things that you're building. Um, and then what we want to do is think about, in, in any particular increment, what kind of value am I delivering to, you know, in a, in a commercial sense, I might say, to my customer, but in a developmental sense, you know, who are the users, who are the beneficiaries, if I can use that phrase, who are the people, the stakeholders that have got an interest in this? What value are they getting from this? And very often, when you look at international development projects, you find the value is, is ephemeral. There isn't really any value to the people. That, so you're trying to persuade people to use something that doesn't actually do anything much for them. That's a common uh, sort of problem. So you want to try to look at what's the value that I'm producing while I'm uh, pursuing this particular um, intervention, this particular development program, this particular project. And then we think, because I've, I've divided my project into a series of these kind of increments, we can then think of a value stream, that each increment is producing some kind of level of value, and I want to look at all of the activities that have gone into that and try and make that as efficient as I possibly can. So what I'd like to do is uh, uh, look at all the kind of activities that are going on. I want to strip out any activities that are not really bringing much benefit, you know, like writing a 30-page requirements document that nobody ends up using. You know, that's not a very efficient use of resources, but this kind of stuff goes on. I, I was um, in, in Ethiopia, saw a kind of tender document that was five, six hundred pages, you know, and somebody was supposed to kind of evaluate that and decide, oh yes, we'll buy one of those. Like, are you mad? Uh, so, uh, you know, the value stream is, is thinking about the whole process, what can I do to improve the value that I'm bringing to the people that I want to impact, and, you know, how can I uh, improve my processes to do that. Uh, we then have others like uh, the idea of flow, so we want the increments to flow well, we want product to come out, we don't want bottlenecks, we don't want things interrupting our ability to deliver. So we're thinking about all the things that inhibit us and prevent us from making progress. Um, the, uh, the, the lean protagonists have this idea of pull, but it's the, it's the kind of people that are supposed to be benefiting that are trying to pull features through this production system. So they should be saying, yeah, that looks quite good, but what I really want is if it did that as well. And then that feature should be sort of sucked through the system to bring further value uh, to those uh, users. And another common theme you get with these uh, production type uh, models is the pursuit of quality. I mean, they say perfection. You know, maybe we don't achieve perfection. 
But it is important that we try to make sure that each increment is better than what we did before. So we're always looking to improve on what's gone before. And you know, there, there might be different measures about what, what do we mean by quality or what, what sort of quality are we looking for. You know, in software, we tend to be wanting to reduce the number of mistakes in the software. Um, we might be wanting to um, make sure that user satisfaction levels go higher and higher and higher and so on. Uh, in other kinds of projects, you know, the notion of quality might mean uh, different things. But it's a really good aspiration to say, you know, rather than imagining that I'm going to roll out an inoculation program to a whole region of country, think about, well, how can I roll it out in one small thing, and then how can I replicate that in other areas, and do that with improving quality and improving efficiency uh, each time I do it, you know? Um, and finally, eliminate waste, and, and you know, this, is, this has been a, a, a major problem on, on, on commercial projects, international projects I've seen, but also in development contexts. Um, and there's all sorts of waste kind of exhibits itself in lots of different ways. Um, things that we start to build but never end up using are an example of waste, like the 30-page uh, requirements document that I keep mentioning. You know, that, that's an example of something that didn't really add value to the process. There might be things that we do each time we build stuff, we might do things, and if we think about it, we might not need to do those things every time. So if we can strip those things out, we can focus all our resources on producing value, uh, then that's going to be a better, uh, um, a better approach. Um, very often in, in engineering disciplines, people sort of add features that they think people are going to need. That they, they think, you know, ah, oh, but, they, you know, these users, they're very nice, but they haven't got a clue. What they need is one of these. And they start building something which actually, I don't, I don't know what to do with that, you know, like the clicker. Uh, so, you know, uh, maybe uh, we have to try to minimise the kind of, uh, uh, and focus, uh, uh, there's some... Uh, American kind of advocate of this sort of thing, uh, who talks about a minimum viable product. So you're talking about what, what, what are the um, smallest number of features that you need to achieve the goal that you're trying to achieve. And that's a very powerful kind of idea uh, that we use right now on, on commercial projects, but I think has got a lot of application uh, in development. So I'm going to kind of switch emphasis now. All of that was about how do I make my initiatives, how do I build systems, how do I make things, how do I do interventions. But the, the analytical framework is more about, you know, why is this not working? Why is, why is some initiative not happening? What's the sort of bottleneck? What are the problems? So we've, we've kind of published a number of papers now coming up with this rather complicated looking idea. Not that I'm going to tell you all about every aspect of it, but just to show that we, you know, we're calling it a tech framework because at the top there's a bubble that's talking about technologies, and you know, technologies rather like Richard, we're talking about hardware, software, networks, storing information, uh, processes that people use. Uh, so technology is quite a broad kind of idea, and. Um, uh, at the bottom right bubble, we're interested in institutions, and, and we're not using the word institutions as a euphemism for organisations. Uh, there is a kind of social social theory or whatever, institutions theory they call it, and you know you can get people talk about institutional logics, which is slightly different from new institutions theory. Uh, I, I'm not too fussed about that, but what we think of is this is a sort of social element, a social, political, legal kind of context in which uh, you're working. So this is a sort of social uh, side of things, and then we have the sort of personal capabilities uh, of people that might want to benefit from this technology, people who can see their lives being changed through it, and so on. And you know, part of my experience working in the IT sector is I've met people from around the world whose lives and families' lives have been changed by their ability to get involved in the IT industry internationally, uh, and so I sort of feel torn. On the one hand, I can see how damaging some of these uh, industries are in, in the sort of uh, digital harms that Richard was talking about. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I can also see people who've enormously benefited uh, from these kinds of things. What, what we've thought of with this theory, we're sort of interested in these three bubbles, but also in their interactions with each other. And we find that you can, you can use this to analyse interventions that are going on, or phenomena that are going on, and where there are sort of bottlenecks or, or negative interactions between these things, very often that's an indicator that things are not going to work in the long run 
in our experience. That's the sort of idea. The other newer idea that I'm uh, wanting to share with you is that we can use this model. You can see I've got a sort of fragment of it up there. Um, dare I touch this? I don't think Red I do. Button. Red button. So these are the, these are the thank you. Uh, so you needed a user manual to work out. How to use it. Uh, so so uh, th this is the, the the sort of three bubbles of the framework that are being used uh, repeatedly at different stages of something unfolding over time. And so we're using this to kind of look at how things are happening, uh, how things are evolving over time, as I just kind of said. So the two case studies, just very quickly to wrap up. Um, so the um, Malaysian Government Human Resource Management System, maybe some of you here are users of that system. Um, for example, uh, school teachers have to uh, use the system uh, if they want to book holidays. So all the public schools in Malaysia, they all have to log on to this system to request when their leave happens. So I'm told. And years ago, uh, that system uh, was, you know, as, as is so often the case, mm, this is a big system, this is complicated, we can't do that. Let's go find some big American company. Well, actually, I don't know where they're from. Uh, there's some big company is going to build that for us. So they, Malaysian government, outsourced uh, building that system uh, to a well-known uh, software vendor. Uh, but while, over, over a period of time, the relationship with that <coughs> outsourcing vendor kind of deteriorated, <coughs> as sometimes happens. The contract meant that it wasn't very easy for the government to get new features into the uh, into the system, and so they were finding it more and more difficult to do uh, enhancements to the system. So here you are, you've got some large, complicated, uh, what some people call a legacy software system, um, and uh, you, you, you'd like to get more control of it. So what do you do? So in September 2011, as a result of this kind of breakdown of the relationship, the government in Malaysia backsourced or insourced terminated the contract with the outsourcing vendor. And so now, it's the Malaysian government's responsibility to manage this rather large information system. Uh, and what they found is once they did that, at that time, by the way, it had of the order of, you know, 470,000 users. This is quite a big system, uh, you know, by any standards. So once they've insourced it, they found, ah, we have a problem, uh, so actually, you know, that, this green arrow is meant to say, well, the, the organization's taken the decision to do the insourcing, that's going to have a positive impact uh, on the technology because now they've got the power to decide. But the problem they had is their staff didn't actually have the expertise they needed to manage and run this kind of system. So they had to get up to speed pretty quickly, and for the people involved, this was not an entirely happy experience. Uh, but what they, they found was they needed to pretty quickly invest in skills and training, so they started very large scale training programs for their IT teams uh, in the Malaysian government. And um, that sort of uh, improved things, so that, there's these red arrows here indicating the lack of skills, prevented the technology being harnessed, that then had a negative impact on the government because the government wasn't able to achieve its goals, so they then had to unlock resources. Uh, which improved the training budgets, which then allowed staff to get more expertise uh, using this kind of model. By the time March 2015 comes along, so a couple of years down the line, uh, they've uh, created new features to allow people to access the system using mobile phone. There were restrictions on the types of browsers that could be used to access the system, so they implemented support for a wider range of browsers. And, you know, by this time, the number of users has increased to 650,000 users uh, and, you know, customer reports of stability of the application and access are much improved and so on. So this was an example of using this framework to kind of look at events unfolding over time, looking at how these social, kind of personal and technology aspects interfere with each other and negatively impact each other, until you get this kind of virtuous circle where confidence in the application is building, the staff have the skills they need to support it, uh, and it's then achieving the government goals of, of, of allowing people to book their leave and all the kind of good things they want to do. Um, the other area I want to talk about, which I've mentioned a couple of times, is cloud computing thing. Here we're interested in utility computing. Um, Nicholas Carr wrote a really nice book 
uh, which is a bit, bit old now, but, but he was reminding us of the days when uh, electricity was not uh, distributed around, but in fact electricity, uh, if you wanted it, you had to make it yourself. And so in the 1890s in America, uh, everybody had to kind of buy themselves a generator in order to get electricity so that they could switch the lights on. Um, and then, you know, somebody worked out, well, wait a minute, why does everybody have to have a generator? Maybe I can have a big generator and I'll give you some electricity, okay? And so there was a sort of transformation that happened, uh, first in America, but obviously it then spread uh, to other places where nobody... You know, okay, nobody apart from us who for various reasons are off network and off grid and all that, but very few people um, have to generate their own electricity. It's much better to have a specialist do that for you and provide that to the building. And I mentioned that model because that's exactly what's sort of happening now uh, with computing. The, the less and less organizations justify having large computers for themselves they're much more likely to buy a service from a specialist provider who is an expert in having big computers. You know, not everybody wants to uh, take care of that. And so we're moving to this utility computing model where if you have a network connection, you can essentially buy computing resources uh, from somebody else. And, you know, you've probably used Facebook, maybe you've used YouTube, Flickr. These kind of applications we now take for granted are being served to you remotely. You're not having to install things on your local machines. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're seeing email servers. We're using Google Mail. You know, has anyone in the room got their own email server? <laughs> not many of you, I guess. Um, but we used to have to do that. If you wanted email, you know, unless you had a university or somebody doing it for you, you would need your own email server. So these things are kind of dying out because it just makes sense to use a, you know, what's essentially a free service from somebody else. Uh, you might want applications. I mentioned Facebook and all these kinds of things. You might want to do computation. So a lot of people are uh, sending things off to other computers to get things done. Uh, or you might be wanting to store information and there are people that do that kind of thing. So I guess I was interested in, okay, this is a phenomenon that's changing uh, the way organizations work here. What's the story uh, in Africa? How's that going? Um, so I'll maybe you start uh, with the sort of less attractive picture in Ethiopia. I mean, I I'm acknowledging that there are some access issues and connectivity issues. Who's got access? You know, if you haven't got access to a network, None of this is going to be very interesting for you, is it? You know? But actually, there are quite a lot of people who do have access to networks. Uh, and so what I found, you know, going back to sort of the 2012 time, uh, you know, really quite senior government officers would have a Gmail or a Yahoo mail government uh, uh, email account. You know? the, the email servers in Ethiopia are really not very reliable, and so it would make sense that you would use one of those kind of uh, email uh, servers. So everybody, you know, more or less, I mean, I, a state minister would have a proper email address, but everybody else, it was like, oh, Gmail, whatever. Um, but what we found looking at things later, you might have expected that things would change over time and that these cloud services would get more common and so on. Uh, there's a whole variety of factors, but the, many of the factors are to do with the uh, regulatory framework, which is kind of unusual in Ethiopia. Uh, they still have a state telecommunications kind of mentality. Uh, state monopoly kind of mentality. So all of these kind of services are operating in competition with the state's provider, and so they're not providing um, regulatory support to encourage people to use these kind of offshore services. Uh, not that Ethiopia has any shores anymore. Uh, so, you know, uh, foreign services uh, in Ethiopia. So actually we found, you know, really quite large enterprises that you would expect would be using these kind of services are not. And one of the weirdest kind of responses we were getting was, well, we don't know if we might be breaking the law if we use these services, so we'd rather not take the risk and we'll stick with, you know, trying to muddle through for ourselves. In contrast, in Niger Nigeria and Ghana, uh, we found back in 2013, uh, SMEs starting to move data to the cloud. And in contrast to SMEs in, in Europe, certainly in the UK, um, the idea was if I give my data to some foreigner, it's going to be safe uh, because my IT guys are all crooks and they won't sell my data to you know, my competitor down the road. And, you know, okay, I've put it particularly unkindly, but 
you know, there was a kind of sense that, oh, the foreigners, you know, their business model is they've got to look after the data, they're going to look after my data. I mean, I thought it was sort of rather naive to trust whoever, but anyway, that's the kind of what we found. Whereas companies here, I mean, I've seen companies with a server where the air conditioning's broken down, the guy's got the door propped open with a chair, anyone could walk in from outside and steal his server, and he's saying, oh, I'm not, I'm not giving my data to some cloud provider, I don't know who they are, <laughs> you know? It's like, oh, okay. So this is a really different perception of risk in Sub-Saharan Africa, well, okay, Nigeria and Ghana, uh, than we were finding in Scotland and, and other parts of England. And now, by 2015, we're seeing evidence, particularly of Ghanaian companies, basically using cloud platforms, but they're providing indigenous financial services, um, pensions products, uh, to customers in uh, West Africa. Uh, so you're buying, you know, West African pension products for a West African market, which are hosted on cloud platforms. So this was the sort of indigenous innovation uh, that Richard's talking about uh, that we're starting to find in 2015 uh, in uh, this uh, space in uh, West Africa. And so, you know, look, there's a very different kind of trajectories here. Context is everything. You know, you, unless you understand these kinds of relationships, you're not going to be sure whether your initiative is going to pan out or not. Um, I didn't make the case very well. I'd probably rather launched into things, and sorry for that. But what I, what I meant to say at the very beginning is, you know, from where I'm sitting, software's everywhere. You've got a phone in your pocket, that's a computer. There's a very good chance that that phone in your pocket has more computing power than the computer that Richard showed us. But more than that, it's got more computing power than the, 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 the spacecraft that landed on the moon. You're walking around with way more, not 10 times, but probably 100 or 1,000 times more computing power in your pocket. Uh, and you know, great news for people like me who write software, because hey, there's loads of people needed to write software. They estimate in Manchester, uh, on top of the graduates that come out of all of the universities, not just my university, but even Richard's university as well, there's, on top of that number, there's 400 jobs which are going to be unfulfilled in Manchester in the digital sector per year for the next four or five years. And so we're sucking people in from other places in order to uh, fulfill those roles. Uh, and what I'm saying is the conventional approach to project management I described at the beginning is very risky. And, uh, you know, if you can possibly avoid it, you want to avoid that plan-based kind of approach to software development or to developing anything. What you want to do is look for ways of creating increments. And sometimes that requires a radically different way of thinking about what it is you're doing. Those increments, you want to think about what value does each increment bring? How does it benefit somebody <coughs> This fragment that I'm able to build with a you know, modest team in a modest amount of time, how is that going to benefit the people that I want to get a benefit from? Once you've worked out how to divide things up into these increments, you can then apply these lean ideas to progressively improve things from one increment to another. Uh, I've told you about our sort of tech framework, which is just saying you have to think about the technologies, of course. We're technologists, that's what we do. But you also have to think about the kind of social, regulatory, organizational context, and what are the personal benefits that people are or are not going to get from something. Uh, and you can use that kind of technique to influence, uh, to investigate influences over time. So thank you very much indeed. We'll go on to the Q&A session or part of the lecture now. So if anybody has any questions for our speakers, please do show us open to you. So, okay. I just want to talk to Julian regarding the, I mean, you spoke about the two case studies, the Malaysian government and the Ethiopian. So I was wondering, when you talk about the cloud computing, so, do you see in future, like, the, I mean, in cloud computing, challenges occurring like it happened in the case of the Malaysian government HRMIS program? As in, when you talk about cloud computing, basically, if you are somehow outsourcing a 
part of your like program or like innovation to another like another bigger company. So like do you see like these sort of snags which happened with the Malaysian government like, impeding the new features and all? So what, what I was trying to get across there was actually the problems that the Malaysian government ha were having initially were not technical problems, they were kind of um, contractual, you could say political problems in, in the relationship they had with their provider. Um, and if you, if you are asking, can you have um, contractual problems with a cloud provider, uh, absolutely yes you can. Uh, and you, know, um, you have to look very carefully at the kind of terms and conditions that your cloud providers are offering you uh, in order to understand what, what you're getting uh, when you buy that kind of service, as you do in any kind of walk of life. I mean, I, yeah, so that's like just one, I mean, I wanted to more focus on like, okay. we'll see like these sort of like problems, like becoming a significant trend that may hamper the, I mean, the cloud computing or like, are they likely to be more like one of cases, or like, do you see this as a like reasonable like barrier in the adoption of cloud computing? And um, so, th th there are there are and have been a number of kind of barriers to cloud adoption. Um, you know, uh, there have been some famous data breaches where people have put sensitive data onto cloud providers, which other people have then been able to hack and disseminate. Um, and, you know, so there are risks with this networking approach, uh, which is one reason why some companies, um, you know, and some companies that you wouldn't necessarily expect uh, have uh, computers that they don't connect to the internet at all. So they have what they call an air gap, uh, which is where they're, they're keeping machines on an internal network, which is no connection at all to the outside world. Uh, because they're very fearful of the possibility of somebody uh, hacking into their in their software, and I, I'm I'm thinking of you know software development projects by airlines uh, that might have an air gap. Because one one of the things you want to worry about is if somebody manages to get in and sort of embed something into something you're building, you know that could be really bad news later on. So yes, there are lots of risks, um, but but the kind of model like the electricity, um, you know what you're sort of saying is. You know, do you think there's a danger that uh, the electricity supply might be interrupted? So, for example, overhead electricity cables might come down in a storm or when a tree falls on them, or in my case, when you cut down a tree and it falls on them. Uh, uh, that's not good. Um, but still, the logic is, I don't really want my own generator. It's much better for me to let somebody else take care of that. And, you know, the, the, the signs are computing's going to go the same way. Because actually... There is a lot of fuss and bother of looking after computers, which we probably don't see unless we're specialists in that area. So having specialists doing that stuff for most people is going to be a good thing. The, the question is, would you want those people to be, you know, like you say, from Silicon Valley, or would you like them to be from your capital city or, you know, from, from your territory? That's a different question, and, uh, you know, I'm not taking a view about that. In fact, I would be encouraging local innovation in that space. So I think I've said enough. There should be other questions, I'm sure. So I have a question for Chris Higgs. Uh, my name is Johannes. I'm from South Africa. Uh, uh, and the question that I wanted to ask was related to this, uh, to this idea of explicit engagement with the development of the field of ICTD. So you previously drawn this distinction between uh, ICTD 0.0, 1.0, 2.0. Um, and I don't really don't want to be uh, putting words in your mouth, but from, from what I understand, uh, the disillusionment with the outcomes achieved by ICTD projects during ICTD 1.0 uh, was at least partly due to a lack of explicit enough explicit engagement with the concept of development. So, in these kinds of projects. Uh, what is it that we mean when we speak of development? Uh, are we only using it kind of as a as a black box that you can kind of just throw it into the study and then you know work with that as well? Um, so, given that, um, I was very interested to hear you know your views on whether that has changed during ICT or since uh, you know ICT 2.0. Do you think essentially there has been enough 
engagement, explicit engagement in ICTD work with, with development and then perhaps also you know, looking at developing informatics as a field, as an emerging field, whether uh, or how that kind of, uh, how that link could be strengthened you know, from the outset of the field. So, um, I think very often you always have to ask the slightly kind of political economy question about who's driving this agenda. When, um, when ICT 4D, I, I differentiate ICTD as something slightly different, but um, when ICTD sort of first started coming onto the agenda in the late 90s, uh, turn of the century, it was being driven by that rationale of explaining of, of the internet at all, etc., the person, the geese person, etc., at all. But what was behind that? A lot of big ICT companies saw oh, there's going to be a big new market. There's real potential for this. They got themselves on the board of things and they sort of helped to set up various uh, um, initiatives and so on. From, so there was quite a lot of technical drive there, and as a result of which, as you kind of described therefore, there was quite a lot of, of technocentricity, technological determinism, which almost never to be failed because it fails to take account of the There was some drive on, on the part of, of the development community, but probably very minor, because in those turn of the century days, the people who were doing the development were not very experienced with, with new technology, they didn't really know very much about what was going on. So a number of things, I think, have, have changed subsequently. The first is that there's a greater variety of players who are in the field at the moment. There's, there are still strong drives from the technology companies, Google, Loom, Facebook, Internet.org, a lot of those sort of things are being driven by technology companies. Um, but from the development side, there, are, there have been a greater number of actors who are now involved, not just governments, not just the private sector, social enterprises, NGOs, and so on. So we've got a greater variety there. And those who are involved from the development sector know more about ICTs than they did before. So there's some opportunity for a rebalancing there. Where I see a particular concern is in the emergence of digital platforms. Because digital platforms seem to be a different beast to the kinds of IT companies that we knew before. Around the turn of the century it was Intel, Hewlett Packard, Microsoft. These were people you could engage with. They turned up at development events. They were real people who had email addresses in which you could talk to. Um, digital platforms, it's really, really difficult to, to find human beings to interact with. There's a kind of firewall of chatbots and, and, and web pages and it's really, really very difficult to find anybody from these very major companies now. Look in the field that I'm particularly working on at the moment around digital labour, these platforms up work and so on. Millions of people are working on these digital labour platforms in developing countries. And yet there is no presence, as far as I'm aware, of of representatives from these platforms in development forums. They absolutely want to stay hidden and uh, as appear to be. And un under the radar. It would be great if things changed and perhaps over time they will start to engage more. So, so, so a kind of a positive and a negative. I see development, people in the development sector able to engage more with ICTs, able to rebalance, able to drive development goals first, technology second. That was the ICT for the paradigm. ICTs as a tool for development, integrated into plans, and projects and so on. The problem could be the digital development uh, paradigm with these platforms, because at the moment, it's very early days, but at the moment we really don't know who these people are, what their agenda is, where they're going, um, and so on. Yes, um, my question is to um, Prof. Richard, and it's basically about um, um, the issue you raised regarding um, the harm the city causes. Um, just, just to clarify, yes. I call them digital harms, mm -hmm. but of course, per se, until we finally get to Skynet and Terminator, um, <laughs> ICTs don't cause harms. <laughs> People cause harms via yeah. ICTs. But that's an important matter, coming back to this point about technological determinism. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. Sorry, but please do, yeah. Go yes, ahead. so um, in the past, the, the, I think the focus was more on the attention they take up the you know, utilization of ICT. And um, 
what I've seen emerging in, 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 in my country, I'm from Ghana, and some countries like Nigeria, is that uh, we see a lot of the youth. You Sakawa know, Sakawa boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, giving up education and pursuing career in, in cybercrime. Yeah. What do you think you know, <laughs> can be done, perhaps in collaboration with state governments, to um, sort of find a way to, if like, address that trend? Because I, 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 I see that as something that has the potential of stifling the growth of such economies in the future. If you do not have, um, if you have all the youth moving into cybercrime or a lot of them, you, you literally got, not going to have a lot of youth with the skills needed in the industry and all that. Um, well, it might be the opposite. You might have a lot of youth who've got a great deal of skills <laughs> because they're, they're, they're learning. I, I think this is a, an absolutely fascinating and absolutely under-researched area. I was emailing yesterday to ask someone if they'd be interested in, uh, in uh, uh, funding this area. This, this, this area of what we call the grey and the black digital economy. There are, we don't know. Is it tens? Is it hundreds? Is it millions of jobs that people are doing right on the edges or beyond the bounds of legality? Um, we could give all sorts of examples that we've seen, not just the, the, the kind of cow boys who are often, I don't know, they, 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 blackmailing online is, is, one of the, is one of the scams, uh, isn't it, that, uh, that they engage in, or just befriending people online, pretending to be a woman, befriending a man, um, um, and, the and so on. A whole plethora that, that I've kind of gathered, you can gather nuggets of, the, the people in Macedonia who are running fake news sites, the, um, the workshops uh, in and around Manila that are um, putting up fake blog postings or fake likes on, on, on Facebook. So there's a, there's a great number of jobs that are, that are out there, but we know very, very little about them. But I wouldn't immediately jump to the conclusion that this is something bad, because um, it could, we, because it's so new, we don't know what the trajectories are. But one can imagine that a number of people working in these areas are picking up skills that they could then legitimise and turn into legitimate and long-term digital careers. Alternatively, they just might be doing something bad for society. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't simply cast them as that. And I'd say at the moment, we simply don't know enough about these people, but we shouldn't. I don't think we should take the simplistic notion of, wow, this is all bad. What can we do to crush it? I would, I would say more, what could we use to harness and um, guide the energies that are being created uh, in, in, in this sense? But a fascinating area, um, I think. Great PhD topic. By the way, Sakao Boys, yeah, it's a Ghanaian phrase, I don't know where it goes from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, that's why I said it. Uh, yes, my question is for Professor Hitsio. My name is Jane, I'm from Uganda. Um, from your uh, presentation, there was a bit about uh, legal and regulatory framework as one of the issues affecting uh, ICT for, develop, uh, for development. Do you think that uh, most developing countries, okay, looking exactly like at Africa, have tried to put in to put in place uh, these uh, uh, legal issues or regulatory framework in in terms of they formulated them, they're actually there, but the issues with uh, enforcement of them, or from your research and from your experience, what do you find is the problem? Is it that the, these are poorly formulated? all the issues with enforcement, what is? Okay, so, so I think in terms of policy, you can, I, um, I, I often give the, um, the analogy of Gordon Ramsay and his um, Kitchen Nightmares and, and those sorts of, sorts of programs in, in, in terms of ICT policy. Um, when he goes in and fixes um, a, a, a restaurant, he looks at the menu, um, but he also looks at the kind of service and he, he looks at the kind of the, the physical restaurant as well. And it's the same with, with the same three issues you find with ICT policies in, in developing countries. So like the menu, there's the content of actual policy, there's the service, which is the process of policy, and then there's the physical stuff, and that's the structures around policy as well. So there are issues to be dealt with in all three of those areas. So not just, of course, developing countries, although there tends to be a greater lag in terms of policy. Um, but, but of, of course, every country in the world is, is, is running to catch up with, with technological changes. That's what I mentioned about this notion of people creating a wild west 
testing uh, through new technologies, and gradually, we, we see it all the time, that, that, that gradually governments are going to be moving in and regulating, but we're all running to catch up. In terms of processes, Uganda's actually, I have a PhD student who uh, did government uh, ICT policy making in Uganda, an interesting example of how actually I think the policy making process was done very well. This was the process um, from about 10, uh, 10 years ago or so. But, but quite participative, quite collaborative in terms of the, of the process that it was undertaken. Implementate, though, too much probably upfront focus on making policy, not enough on how we actually implement the policy. And then there's this notion of structure. Who gets involved? And again, Uganda was a good example in terms of bringing in NGOs particularly, allowing them citizens through the NGOs to have a voice, so it wasn't just dominated by the private sector, because of course government itself is often quite lacking in capabilities around ICT policy. So Uganda's actually quite a good idea of where things have been um, historically, at, at least, got, got right. But all three of those areas definitely need action and definitely need strengthening. And unfortunately the pace of requirement is only going to is only going to pick up. You think of all of these areas that are coming in all the time. You, you, you know you only have to read the newspaper headlines or the web headlines in, in any country these days. Pretty well every day there'll be something new that has happened as a result of digital technologies that we weren't expecting and something needs to be done about it. Some kinds of some kind of of, of intervention. So it's clearly going to be a, a, critical, uh, a critical issue. Maybe, maybe should we ask for a yeah. question? Yeah. Any specific questions? Yeah. 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 So I'm Lorena again, and I'm from Tanzania. I just want to know if there are specific limitations, I mean, from your experience implementing software systems and using library. There are specific cases where you came across um, limitations to do with the use of IJ in building systems. Yeah, um, there are some quite well documented agile projects that have failed quite spectacularly. Here in the UK we had an NHS project uh, which was being conducted with one of the major international outsourcing partners who got so fed up with the NHS that they decided to walk away from the project, um, having been paid or something, but nevertheless, that was a pretty disaster. So, I mean, there are there are cases. It's, it's not. You know, we tend to say it's not a magic bullet <coughs> in the sense that it doesn't solve all of the problems. Uh, but the general evidence, the body of evidence, is uh, you stand a lot better chance if you use those techniques uh, than if you if you use the conventional uh, plan based techniques. Can Can I just ask a, a kind of at least one or maybe two follow ups on, on that? <coughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> So, are there particular issues? I'm kind of thinking of the notion of design reality gap. It doesn't just apply to systems, it also applies to methodologies as well. Are there particular challenges about agile in developing countries? One could readily imagine um, the capabilities that are required, but also maybe some cultural issues in, in some contexts where the notion of um, a, a flatter in, um, hierarchy um, might be but might uh, create challenges for, for applying Agile in ICT proposals. Yeah. Uh, so the, the amount of data we have is still quite limited. Uh, but I think you've, you've astutely picked on some good areas. I mean, the, the, one of the major problems with Agile is, is you want to get feedback as you go. And so it's, it becomes you're reliant on somebody to give you that feedback. And one of the problems is the people who are asking you to build the stuff really can't be bothered to keep sitting down with you and give you feedback from their point of view every five minutes. It's like, leave me alone, go build it, when you've done it, come back and tell me what you've got, you know? So there's a common problem, uh, and this is well documented, uh, that, that getting the customers to engage and give you that feedback is quite hard work. Uh, I can see that being a problem, particularly where who it is that you want feedback from is a much more difficult to define constituency. Uh, and so reaching the parts of that constituency could be quite a challenge uh, from the viewpoint of the people implementing a project. Um, the, su superficially, one might think that if you're used to working in a culture where there's a very command and control, tailorist kind of view of management, 
moving to this, because the, the sort of methods tend to be associated with what we call self-organizing teams. So the idea is that the team is not being told uh, what to do, uh, each member of the team is not being told what to do in any particular day, rather they're saying there's a pool of tasks, I'll do that task, another member of the team will say, well, I'll do that task. And so it's a more sort of um, self-managed kind of approach. Uh, but actually, I think people can adapt to that culture. And we've got some evidence, in fact, not from Tanzania, but from Kenya, uh, of teams that seem to be able to make that uh, adaptation uh, reasonably successfully. But it would, be, it would be an interesting question if you translated that. The kinds of examples you seem to be giving were where um, the clients, or those being from whom feedback was sought, were probably other professionals in other public private sector organisations and so on. It might be more of a challenge if they were beneficiaries in a, in a, from the base of the pyramid. Well, I thought, I thought I did say that where, where, where it's a more... Uh, well, you said around it's more diffuse, but I'm thinking where there's more of a social hierarchy between someone who's got a master's degree from the University of Nairobi versus someone who's from Kibera and, and kind of... Yeah, I agree. So I wanted to just follow up that on that, though, because I mean, I think one of the core issues that is going to face is, okay, transformation is, might be a bit of a pipe dream, Sustainability, yeah, that's got a whole set of issues all of its own. So I think a lot of future uh, concerns are going to circle around growing inequalities and inclusion and exclusion and so on. So is, is there evidence or is there a research agenda around saying that Agile might be a better methodology to make more inclusive digital information systems in, in, in development? Uh, that it might help to reduce inequalities in the long term by the nature of the methodology itself versus the old waterfall? Uh, well, as, as a sort of agile evangelist, that would be my hope. Yeah. And I don't think I can, I can give you evidence of that. Okay, right so it's now. a research agenda. On, on it could well be a research agenda, yeah. I think, um, I have a question for both um, Julian and Richard. Uh, I'll start with um, Julian. Um, I noticed in your, your models, um, it, it, the, the, the pyramid model, the, the, you had um, the technology being at the, the apex of your model. And based on the, the examples you gave, it sounded to me as if the human capacity component was very critical to actually making uh, uh, the model work. And I was wondering um, if there are a particular reason for the technology to be um, always at the top of the pyramid as opposed to the human capacity element. Yeah, it, it kind of depends on where you're starting from, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So our assumption was all the problems were going to be technical problems, so that's where we put that at the top. But actually when we look at real large-scale interventions, it very often isn't the technology that's the problem. Mm -hmm. There's other factors at play. That also helps to make it tick rather than sit or ink. <laughs> <laughs> solution you came up with as it relates to grassroots innovation, I, I, I kind of like that, but there are two issues that I wanted to bring to the table and probably ask you to um, comment on. Um, for a lot of developing countries, the issue of the re research and development budget, um, one issue, and the, the issues of copyright and patenting, and how that affects the ability to, you know, to innovate from the grassroots level. Um, what are your comments on yeah, no, I mean, obviously you, you, you need to look at, look at those. I mean, it depends also, we don't quite know what the nature of these grassroots innovations might be. They, they could be, I don't know, they could be very incremental and, and some that wouldn't necessarily be suitable for, for patterns and so on. But I, think, but I think that's why you need something like, I don't know, some of you may know there's the Honeybee Network in, in, in India, and it, that, that's its job, is to really go around, look for grassroots innovation, and then support their development, including assistance with patterns and so on, and they get support for that. So there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't have some kind of organisation that would be doing that, doing this work, as I said, harvesting, um, assessing and evaluating whether there's real value, whether there's real novelty, innovation, in the kinds of things that they're, they're uh, identifying within grassroots communities and then looking at, at processes of scaling. I mean, the other thing that you've got to say as well is, uh, that's making an assumption that, of a commercialisation model. It's not, necess it's not necessarily that grassroots innovations might be something that a people want to commercialise, or that you could commercialise. It could just be a kind of a relatively, just a kind of a, a relatively a good idea that people are just happy for 
others, others, to, uh, others to share. Um, this kind of derives, as I say, it's just a massive lack of understanding. I've asked the guys in the Honeybee Network about whether they've got digital innovations they're coming up with, but they're still very much in a sort of intermediate technology mode of thinking about physical, physical objects. Um, the evidence we've got to some extent comes from M-Pesa in Kenya, and we look very much at the, the innovation model there, but all of the work we've published on inclusive innovation, most of the ideas come from M-Pesa. And there, there definitely were grassroots innovations. There were ideas that the agents were coming up with about how to use M-Pesa, just small ideas about management of floats and, and so Just briefly talk about what M-Pesa is. Oh, yeah, okay. I guess I never had that idea. So M-Pesa is the, is the mobile money system in in Kenya, which is sort of always cited as the most successful example, and whatever it is, a quarter of the GDP supposedly goes through uh, goes through and pays it every uh, every, every month. Um, interestingly, cited as an example of African innovation, but actually the system is written in Cambridge. Um, <laughs> but um, but but there there were these incremental innovations, not necessarily. Uh, specifically digital innovations, but innovations around the digital technologies that make them more usable and appropriate and help them be appropriated by the people living in um, the low-income areas. And, and there was no need or question of patenting, patenting there. This was just something, ideas that circulated around and improved the system. A bit like, a bit like the notions that uh, Julian was coming up with, the sort of the, 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 the iterative cycles and prototyping and uh, and, and so on. So I think if you're looking for commercialization, there are definitely models you could already pick up and use in lots of countries to say, how can you pick up commercialized patent um, health funds? You need obviously you need, uh, um, venture capital and similar funding for those sorts of things. But there may be many other ideas that don't necessarily have to sit within that kind of traditional commercialization framework. But we just don't know. I guess we want someone. There's a guy called Jan Chipchase, who, who I don't know if any of you know. He sort of he goes around the world looking for ideas and and innovations, and but particularly the way people are using mobile technologies. We need someone to kind of get out there, sitting and rooting themselves in local communities. Now that ICTs have diffused into those communities, and find out what are the innovations that are going on right there, down on the ground, in a in a typical kind of maybe a low income. Uh, area, not, not the sort of the high-tech hubs and incubators and so on that we often hear about, but on the ground. Maybe there's nothing there at the moment, but there sure as hell will be at some point, and so there's definitely something there. It comes back to the kind of grey and black digital economy. There are things that, that because our views of what's going on in the world are slightly behind the curve of the diffusion of technology, there are things we are kind of, that are going on that we're somewhat blind to, and, and, and hence research projects exist in order to expose what's, what's, going, uh, what's going on. I've got a, as, as an example, I've got a student who's out right now in Vietnam looking at what's going on in uh, fab labs and hacker spaces and 3D printing. All of these areas that are coming up as a result of the, the small scale ideas of Industry 4.0. Well, just all kinds of fascinating things, sort of new classes of digital nomads who have given up their lives in the US and Western Europe and they're going and basing themselves out in Developing countries in Nairobi, in, in uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, and just all over, all over the place, innovating, innovating, innovating. But kind of under the radar until we get people to actually go out and trace all of these new phenomena that are arising in, in, as part of becoming digital development. But given the willingness that we have here, I think some of you could go on to, to do that, to take that point, to your, let us know more about what's happening at the grassroots level. Yes. Hi, my name is Sandra, and I'm directing this question to you. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, internationalization for socioeconomic development. I'm doing my dissertation on the digital. Well, the University of Manchester has the, la the second largest amount of international students in the UK, and it, you know, the UK on the whole, and America and Australia, they garner a lot of money from internationalization. So I'm looking at uh, the digital technologies that the university uses to recruit and meet the needs of students with the hope of helping universities that are lagging in internationalization, particularly Jamaica, the Caribbean, uh, how they can increase internationalization and reap the benefits, not just economic, but socio social, cultural, uh, academic, 
professional benefits that this would uh, bring up. What, what do you, I don't know, what, you, what would you guys think about this? Is it practical? Uh, what do you think? I know particularly I've been getting the use of social media from students. I've interviewed students and I've interviewed staff and they're basically telling me that they use a lot of social media advertising, they use a lot of, you know, they engage students, they create relationships, so that relation, relational marketing is what they've been using. And I think if this is what they've, they've been doing, then we practically can use this in Jamaica to uh, attract more students, with the fact that Jamaica is pretty, um, very popular for tourism as well. So if I, I'm thinking of uh, using di uh, digital marketing with tourism uh, enhancing or advertising Jamaica, we already are known worldwide. So if we just maximize or capitalize on our popularity, mix that with education, hopefully develop the country, I don't know, what do you guys think about that? I, I mean, so, so Ken, Kentaro Toyama has written this book, Geek Heresy, which is all kind of, uh, which is his experiences of particularly running um, Microsoft Research India. And, and his, his main notion is, is what he calls, rather grandly, amplification theory. But what he's kind of saying is, um, which I wouldn't necessarily completely agree with, but, but just that all ICTs do is they amplify existing human motivations and capabilities. And a key challenge for you in internationalization is to say, why do people come and study in the UK? Is it because of the presence or absence of social media? Mm -hmm. No. Of course it is. It's because of the quality and the reputation and, and you know, lot, the language. Lots of other factors are what actually are the foundational motivation and incentive for international students to come and um, study in the UK. And of course, the presence of Commonwealth scholarships. <laughs> um, <laughs> He'll get invited back. <laughs> um, so those are all those kind of core drivers and motivations and, 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 and shapers. So social media is important, but it, but it's it, and, and you need to have it, and you need to get your digital um, strategies right. But you've got to think about the foundations um, as well. And actually, that's a message that's true of ICT for the general. That if you look at the kind of messages that that I spent a long time kind of really reviewing all the research that's going on in ICTs for development for the book to try to understand for myself well, what, what really is the message, what, what's really going on here. And the fundamental message at the moment is, what I've said before, of, of incremental benefits only. Why? Because the foundations of what determine outcomes are much broader things like social structures, um, institutional factors, capabilities, access to resources, uh, structural relationships, and so on. All of those things and utility, incentives and motivation. So it's all of those things that we have to understand. ICTs are changing. There's, there's no doubt about that. And plus, ICTs are amplifying, helping people with particular agendas to achieve something and denying other people with particular agendas. So they're definitely changing the landscape. I don't disagree with that uh, at all. But, it, but we have to both come up with the same message from TIC and, and from what I've been saying as well. It's all of these much broader factors that you've got to engage with, or else you will be uh, a naive kind of techno-optimist imagining that technology is going um, is to is change, change the world. So it is going to change the world, but not necessarily in the ways that you're, you're hoping for. So you've got to take these broader visions. That's not to give a negative message about, about technology. There's a lot of hope in technology. There's a lot of potential in technology. But to make it work right, we have to understand these broader factors that the tech model can be. Well, thank you for that. Well, I have thought about some of those broader issues with the, the fact about language. Jamaica is English, so a lot of these international students want an, uh, an English education. We have that. They, do, do, you they work, do you work for the Jamaican marketing? <laughs> 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 but I'm very passionate. You could just, you could just well, talk yes, to you it. will. <laughs> you just I think I might do something in marketing. <laughs> And I also thought about the fact that we do have quality education, higher education, it's just that they don't market themselves and people don't know. I don't know if you've heard about the University of the West Indies, which is the premier university. There are like four branches and they produce like the most families in the Caribbean. But nobody knows that. 
That's because they don't put themselves out there. So I have thought about the broader issues. Quality might not have as much quality as the UK and other UK, um, United, um, United States and Australia, but we do have quality. It's just that we're not known. Uh, we're not, hmm? people don't, um, they think slightly. Yeah, but you, you're assuming information and communication is, a, is, a, is, is a, you know, you'd have to truly ask yourself how core an issue is information and communication amongst the whole realm of decision making. Look at, of course, I'm sure you have done, what determines international student decisions about where they get That would be a start. And, and, and I think, you know, so, and it's, 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 I agree with Richard's kind of analysis coming from an engineering point of view and from an educationist point of view. Um, but one of the questions is the role of role models. Yes. So around the world, you know, you'll find role models who are in leadership positions, either in the commercial sector or in government sector, who have studied in the US or Europe or, or wherever it might be. The question is, what are the role models of people leading countries outside of the Caribbean that went to the Caribbean to get their education? And so that that's essentially what you're competing with. You know, so in India there'll be you know, government officers that went to universities in the UK, and maybe Manchester's one of them. You know, uh, it's, it's not that they're prime ministers in Manchester, they're prime ministers there, and that's what creates a pull. Because you kind of know, that person's done very well, if I can copy their career path, I'll do very well. You know, and, and that's the kind of model that, that works. That's the kind of model that works when you're looking at gender inequality. So if you see successful women in, in positions, that's more likely to encourage other women to, to pursue that kind of path. So I think, you know, they, these are the sorts of challenges that, that having access to a Facebook group or something is not going to be able to overcome. But if you, if you pursue the social media and education route, what you may find is you'll build more of a following, students will feel more engaged, grades might go up. You know, so there could be lots of good things that would flow from that if it works well. Uh, and particularly about the kind of peer support kind of element, uh, that was, is one of the things that universities in the Global North value from that sort of thing. And the ability to hang on to people after they go, and so being able to then tap for funds people who graduated four or five years ago, so the alumni community and how they can add value. And again, you know, in my experience, I, I don't have experience particularly in, in the Caribbean, but in Africa, the university is not very good at tapping into those alumni. Uh, and even in the UK, we've been quite slow compared to the US, uh, where that's a really big thing. As soon as you graduate, they start asking you for money. <laughs> <laughs> you wait, you'll start getting <laughs> those emails. Okay, so we have time for a few more questions. Please do think about your questions, try to make them as concise as you can, so that we can fit in as many as we can in the time that we have left. Hi, um, my question is directed to Dr. Bass. Uh, you talked about agility, and I've heard this in different areas. Mm -hmm. I've heard this in business that um, networks need to be agile, cooperation needs to be agile, especially at the pace that we're going at. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm coming from the media um, industry, that is also a necessity that we have to be agile. Mm -hmm. But the pace that these industries are going at now, and that is something that you spoke about. Coming from, from your perspective, what is the main driver behind this maddening pace that, that really makes no sense at this point? Uh, I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, it's, 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 it, well, uh, you know, uh, so there are people who argue that the pace that we're experiencing now is actually nothing compared to the 20 or 30 years in the late 19th century when at the beginning of that period there were no railways, there was no telegraph, uh, essentially communication around the world took months uh, and then during the lifetime of those individuals, as I mentioned, railways came in, people could move around more readily, uh, telegraph came in so there was instant communication across continents. So those, there are people who argue that that epoch in history there were more profound changes that affected a larger number of people. But I think most people do accept that the pace of change has increased and that digital technologies have been a part of a driver for that because it allows communication between a much larger number of people and so ideas can be spawned and proliferate much more rapidly. And, and Richard alluded to the fact that not all of these are good ideas. So bad ideas can also 
uh, be spawned and proliferate at enormous uh, rates, and the whole thing of fake news and, and, and those sorts of things are also uh, a major issue. Uh, but it's above my pay grade to work out why that is happening right now. I, I don't know. Maybe you have got better answer than that. Um, I would give a one word answer, which is capitalism. And, um, you know, what, what, what is it but capitalism, but kind of digital capitalism, hyper capitalism, whatever you want to call it, because exactly at that point, because we live in this ever more interconnected world. You know, what drives, what drives innovation? Largely, uh, people come up with ideas, but what pushes, them to, what pushes them to do that is probably more competitive impulse than a collaborative impulse. And what pushes them to do it quickly is the competitive impulse that comes from capitalism, the profit, and so on. So this combination of a particular economic system and a particular technological platform, uh, that, that I would say is... is, is the answer to what's driving this sense of um, everything happening and, and happening ever, ever faster. And of course the thing is, we as individuals, you can see it in your own life. Were you to disconnect for a week, for example, you would feel a lot calmer. Uh, because you wouldn't feel as if, oh my goodness, there's so much happening and I've got to take so many things in, all these messages from all of my social media platforms and emails and everything that I've got to answer, and wow, everything's happening at once. And, pretty soon we've gone out. So we're kind of part of the issue ourselves because we are so hyper-connected ourselves as well. So it applies in our individual lives as much as it does. And, and the question is, if, if, you, keep, if you keep tightening the, the, the clock spring, eventually, I don't know if you've ever done that, but eventually the clock goes down and then um, it's broken. So we don't know. Uh, whether that's going to kind of keep happening and what the alternatives might be. But anyway, and another issue we haven't talked about at all is the whole future of work and the notion that um, good luck with keeping the return on investment on the scholarship because who knows what in five or ten years time we'll be doing work. Maybe instead of human beings, you have a couple of robot professors doing this stuff. But luckily, you won't all be here anyway because you'll just be virtual entities. <laughs> Peter Lunga from Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, this is to Professor um, Higgs. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the most celebrated innovation of money transmission from Kenya. That is uh, impressive. Uh, I'm just wondering, why has it been adopted here? Is it because it's an Africa they give? Well, um, so, so I, as I, I already trod on dangerous ground once by saying that it was written in, the code was written in Cambridge. So I, I won't tread in that on that minefield again about whether or not it's actually an African idea. Um, <laughs> Michael Joseph, I'm sure, we've got particular view on that, the guy who did it. Um, it, it. I mean, it has. Uh, we've got uh, Wizards and, and various, various things in the UK. But it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that this has been a great example of reverse innovation. Everybody kind of quotes it, the fact of something that was first, okay, wherever the initial code was written, yeah, it was actually all implemented and, and, and uh, run out of, uh, run out of uh, Nairobi. Uh, and kind of five years later, it, I, it amused the hell out of me. When you see these adverts coming on British TV about, oh, you can pay money with your mobile phone. I was thinking, you could do that years ago in Cambridge. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that this is kind of a bigger picture of the notion of grassroots innovation. But as well as being a potential for reverse innovation from the, the base of the pyramid, kind of physically, if you like, from the villages and the slum areas and the canaries of, of the world, up to more mainstream markets. Equally, we'll see more and more reverse innovation from the global south to the global north. Necessarily so. What is it? 80-85% of the world's population lives in the global south. And as more and more technology goes out there, more and more companies, these digital nomads going out and innovating, and more and more innovative capacity going, we're going to see more and more of those examples. So it's an example of reverse <coughs> innovation. I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of them in, in, in years to come. I'm excited to see them. Uh, if I may, I mean, it's, it's not an area of really of, of my expertise, but we did look at this a little bit because one, one of the factors was it jumped outside 
the institutional regulatory environment of the banking sector. Whereas here in Europe, the telecommunications companies have not been allowed to do that. And so it was a telecommunication company that was to some extent driving the M-Pesa initiative. Uh, but here in Europe, that hasn't happened. So it's been the banks that have been trying to give people access to mobile phones to, to, to manipulate their, uh, financial transactions and so on. And, and so they're much less enthusiastic about it because they've got branches and they've got lots of other reasons why they don't really want people to do that. And so it's that, you know, it's emphasising how the context is everything. The fact that uh, M-Pesa engaged with all those agents that were selling top-up cards and, and, and screens for the mobile phones and those became the agents for M-Pesa. It's like you had a ready-made sales force of, you know, uh, how many hundreds of thousands or millions of people out there in the population. Uh, the, the, the banking sector here doesn't have any kind of uh, aspiration to uh, take advantage of such a, such a community of other employees kind of thing. So, so one of the interesting questions we asked was, why has it been so successful in Kenya? And, it, and it's struggled. The, the, the struggles are being overcome to some extent, but it's, it's really struggled in many other developing countries. And it's exactly for those reasons, that notion that there were networks of people who could be fairly readily identified with contacts to act as the agents, a pretty almost perfect light, light touch regulation from, from government, more probably by accident than, uh, than design. And other is issues as well, wasn't it? Because I think it was the, the trouble around the, the elections and everybody kind of being locked down. It suddenly gave a rationale for why people needed to move money around, and it, it, it suddenly became the kind of the, the, the killer app just at the right moment. It, 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 uh, it, it came to that, and that really helped to kickstart. Plus, other you know some other reasons, uh, some other uh, reasons as well about the, the nature of the market and the fact that there was a, a just the right combination of Safaricom, quasi monopoly, but a little bit of competition that kept pushing Safaricom to continue. Uh, innovating as well. So a particular set of circumstances in Kenya that it's disappointingly been, been much more difficult to replicate in, in other countries. Okay, last question. So there will be time for to talk with, with, with the last speakers after this is a networking reception. Um, uh, my question is to Mr. and two of the young soldiers. Having uh, worked in and also in parts of Africa, what do you think are the capacity gaps in probably in you know, IT, ICT, in terms of probably software development, and also in other areas of ICT that probably could be thinking of you know, feeling and product? Um, yeah, well, we've wrote a paper, and you know, I tend to see it through a university lens. So I think of what kind of degree programs people need uh, in order to acquire the kind of skills they're looking for. Um, what I saw in my experience is there's a preponderance of computer science degrees, uh, whereas actually information technology degrees are much more relevant to the kind of skill set that people would probably need in, in many global south kind of settings. And that's more to do with you know setting up infrastructures and creating systems out of, out of bits of uh, hardware and software, whereas computer science is really you know, about the science of computation in its pure sense. And so although a spin-off of that is that people get some skills, uh, that's not really the core kind of skill set that, that you probably need the most. So IT is an important area, and I'm a software engineer, so I would argue that software engineering is a very useful skill set to have. Uh, there's lots of opportunities to innovate in that space. The cost of entry is very low. Um, so you know, NGOs can innovate in that space very easily with mobile phone apps and so on, um, without investing uh, huge amounts of resources these days. And actually quite small teams can support quite large uh, consumer bases by using the kind of tricks that, that Richard was talking about negatively of not having a kind of customer support infrastructure that's face to face, but by putting up the kinds of barriers that they do, uh, you can actually support quite a large number of people with quite a small team. Uh, which if you're trying to roll out innovation is a very attractive proposition because you don't need an army of customer support type people geographically spread around and all that which would be very expensive. So I would argue the kinds of capacity areas are in those areas and there there are sort of international documents that describe what, what are the skill sets in the subject areas that I've been describing. I, I kind of, and, and you know, we push it 
one, one, maybe one step further as well. I mean, we put our money where our mouth is in the design of our master's programs because we, we went out and we looked at a series of, of successful projects in, in Africa. And we tried to identify what were the critical success factors, how could we build those into our, into our programs. The critical success factor, the fact that it kept on coming up again and again, was, was a champion of, of a particular type, a champion who was a hybrid. I already explained what the hybrid was. It's something they understood the mainstream business of their organization, but they understood enough about information systems and information technology to be able to talk to both sides and to integrate, to be able to see what is it possible to do with digital technologies that will help achieve the organizational or development goals. So that, that I think, is a key gap. That's what our master's program um, um, delivers. You can talk to the two who are on our master program and ICT for D if you, if you want as well, because for that one we add on along that, alongside that dual hybrid, this tribrid notion wrapping around of development and development projects as well. But those key individuals, I think, are what you, are what you require, because there is a move towards the commoditization of technical skills. Those platforms I mentioned, like Upwork, they're the human equivalent of cloud computing. We call them sometimes the human cloud. So that if you want technical stuff done, to some degree, you can get that done anywhere in the world by just going into one of these platforms. So we're seeing it's those slightly higher level skills are the things that we're trying to build through our master's programs because those are the people we think are really going to drive successful use of ICTs in, in development. Great, thank you. So now there is a drinks reception with a few refreshments as well. We can give a big round of applause to our